Vinny Tortorich, celebrity trainer to Hollywood stars, says that exercise is absolutely the worst way to lose weight. Vinny beat leukemia by going against the conventional nutrition narrative. He learned how to power his body with food that actually nourishes. Turns out, counting calories, miracle drugs, and fat-free foods are not the best way to a healthy life. Curious what he says we should eat? Listen up. And by the way, our next episode is with a vegan. Vinny, it's so great to have you here. And I would say that I have had an awakening when it comes to health, nutrition, fitness. Over the last few years, it started with the lockdowns and COVID. And I built a little bit of a distrust in what the experts would say, because so many of the things that they said made no sense to me. And then most recently, I think what really set me off was when I heard an interview with the director of nutrition and obesity research, NORC. There was a woman by the name of Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford, who has all the letters of the alphabet after her name, mm -hmm. you know, MBA, whatever. And she was hired by the government, right? And so she's endorsed by our government. And she said right. that obesity is actually genetic. And so it doesn't really matter if you diet, if you exercise, if you sleep, if you try to de-stress, none of that really matters because you're likely to be obese, I guess, anyway. And so when I heard that, I just said to myself, Gosh, I mean, all of these things that these experts are telling us make absolutely no sense. And so we got to dig into this a little bit. And so that has been really my journey into wanting to understand better what kind of food we're being fed, what kind of information we're being fed. And it's really why I became so fascinated with your work and your story. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you mentioned a book that I wrote oh, 10, 11 years ago. Actually, it was written before that because... The book started during a crisis. We had the, the financial breakdown back in 2008. So most of us, were, we were having trouble, you know, as a, as a trainer, you know, clients went away and then clients started coming back. And then we had here in, in Hollywood, we, we had the, the big writer strike. And when you're a trainer that works with actors and actresses, all of a sudden your business goes away again. So I got together with, with one of the biggest writers in Hollywood, Dean Laurie, and we, we put together Fitness Confidential. And it came out of, you know, a stressful time. And here we are 10 years, 11 years later, we're back in a stressful time when we get to COVID and the book is alive again. The book sold like hotcakes. Again, don't eat hotcakes. And then it slowed down a bit and during the pandemic, all of a sudden, we saw an uptick on Amazon and everywhere people could buy books. So you look at that and go, okay, people are interested in the subject, right? People want to know what the truth is. And then when you watch Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes interviewing this woman, and she's saying, hey, being fat is not your fault. I agree with a portion of that. It's not your fault because you've been sold a lie. So everyone's trying to do the right thing, but they've been sold a big lie. So what do you do with that? So at first I'm going, okay, she's right. It's not your fault. But then she starts blaming it on genetics and it's not how much you exercise and how much you watch what you eat. And none of that matters. And she's also pushing this agenda of kids, 11, 12, should be on medication mm -hmm. to lose weight. They're actually now talking about cutting your stomach out, telling you, hey, your kid can't be trusted with a stomach. We're going to get rid of that before their 12th birthday. They don't need that. Are you kidding me? And Leslie Stahl's just sitting there going, hmm, okay. And I'm sitting there going, you're not going to ask her anything? Are you not allowed to ask this woman anything? Are we softballing it this much at this point? Well, I think what's terrifying about what Dr. Fatima said is that you're basically signaling to the population that there's nothing you can do and so you might as well give up. It doesn't matter. It's in your genetic. And so you might as well just take a pill to try to fix it because there's no way to actually take any sort of action that can help you. And I think you've learned from your experience, I'd love to hear your story a little bit, that there's actually a lot you can do with proper diet and nutrition 
and an exercise, right? I mean, you were confronted with cancer, right? And, and you actually found a way to starve cancer out of your body by eliminating sugar. Will you just share that story with me? Before I share that, you said something very important. She says that it's in your genetics. Okay, let, let's go with that for a second. If I was interviewing Fatima, my first question would be, where do these genetics come from? Were they around in 1969 during Woodstock? Because I've seen the photos. Were those people not the, the parents of us and now the grandparents of us, right? So when are these genetics just overwhelm this country? So true. Right? Special K, Kellogg, Special K. You're too young to remember this, but I'm not. Back in the early 1980s, anyone who's watching this interview, when you're done with this, they can go click and find the Special K Pinch an Inch. The entire ad was, if you can pinch an inch, you're too fat. Hmm. Can you imagine that? Pinch an inch. They show the ad, oh, I'm pinching an inch. Can you imagine? Yeah. People can grab, we now have shows called My Thousand Pound Life. I'm not making this up. This is a real thing. Yeah. Right? My Thousand Pound Life. Yet, a few short years ago, same gene pool, we haven't changed genetics. You don't have to be a scientist to understand this stuff. Right. Okay, I'll play along. When did those genetics come into play? Right. We lived through the Rubenesque period in this world. Fat is beautiful. I get it. Right? We're not moving in the right direction. So shaming is bad, but celebrating it, not good. Yeah, I think also one of the things that you said that just resonated <clears throat> with me is that it's not about fat shaming because in many cases, I don't think it's the population's fault. I think we've been really manipulated to think that certain things are healthy for us while they're actually not healthy for us. I learned so much about food recently, things that I assumed is good for me and good for me to feed my children. And now I'm learning that it's actually not good for kids and not good for humans in general to consume the amount of, you know, grains and sugar and all of these things that we don't even know how to pronounce that are in the, this processed food industry that we've been sold as heart friendly type of products. And so I agree with you. We can't blame the population for being overweight or obese when we have an entire industry that is actually setting us up for failure and people are getting sick and they're getting cancer and they're they're not understanding why they're doing everything right according to what the experts are telling them to do but they're not doing everything right because what the experts are telling them to do is actually not good for us you couldn't be more correct people we don't hear on commercials we don't hear grains we hear heart healthy grains Oh, wait, they, they're heart healthy. Why? Well, because Kellogg said that they're heart healthy. Quaker Oats said they're heart healthy. And then that becomes part of the vernacular, right? We, we just throw that in. You, you have the American Heart Association, the AHA. They say heart healthy, and you go, well, wait a minute. Aren't they on our side? Well, you would think, but their money comes from Coca-Cola, it comes from Kellogg's, it comes from Unilever, it comes from all of the biggest corporations. And by the way, this is not hidden. I'm not, I'm not sitting here with a tinfoil hat going, I believe that this is crazy stuff. You can go look this stuff up and you don't have to look, you can do a simple Google search to see who's supporting the AHA and where all of their money comes from, right? Anytime, I tell people, anytime you see Harvard on a study when it comes to health, Turn about face and move because it's already been tainted because Walter Willett and company over at Harvard have been taking money from Unilever and everyone else for decades. You, you brought up and I didn't talk about it yet. You know, I thought I was the healthiest guy in the world, right? Because I was doing everything right. And of course, you know, when you're sitting there with a six pack and you're feeling good and everything is great, you think you're going to be fine, right? Now, with my clients, I always kept them on low-carb diets. That was my secret as a trainer. But I was an endurance cyclist, so I felt, oh, I had to have all of these, these grains and carbohydrates and, and eat these power bars and goo and all this stuff on the bike, right? I, I have to have this stuff because that's what I learned in college, mm -hmm. right? I got that from Tulane. Why would they lie to me, right? So once I had cancer, 
And this was back in 07. Yeah, when did you get cancer? How old were you? You were already a celebrity oh. trainer at that point, Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd been working with clients for years and years and years. I had to take a sabbatical and go deal with, with leukemia for a, a long period. And I was eating anything and everything I could during cancer because I was just wasting away. So anytime you're not puking, you're trying to eat something. So that's something sometimes was ice cream because it was the only thing appealing. Because I was living in L.A. and it looked like I was beating cancer, all of my clients were like, you need to start juicing. You need to become a vegan. You need to. Everyone, I love in L.A., everyone says you need to, as if it's a fait complete. So you didn't do any of that? Well, I went into my doctor who was this top oncologist. I know everyone says I have the best doctor. I'm not saying I had the best doctor. But my doctor didn't just work on patients. She was a research scientist, and she really didn't see patients. And the only reason I was able to get to this oncologist, th this blood expert, was because one of my clients was a very wealthy. With you had connections. I had connections because of what I did for a living. So I got to a person that normally does not see patients. And I said to her, everyone's telling me wheatgrass juice. I got to ju I, I got to become a vegan. I need to get a, a micro macro, medium micro macro and, and a quinoa. I need to do all this stuff. What's the truth? And she said, no, none of that will work. <laughs> wow. like, Wait, what, 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 what? And she goes, you're that guy in Beverly Hills that tells people not to eat sugar and grains. I said, yeah. She goes, do that. I said, and this is in 07. So she already knew. They, scientists knew. But the media, you see, everything that they know now, the media sometimes don't know for years. So in 07, she goes, she said to me, she goes, most cancer cells, it's a closed cell. It doesn't use oxygen to grow. They use carbohydrates right. to grow. And I'm sitting there going, really? She goes, yeah. So if you just starve the cancer cells of carbohydrates, they won't grow as fast. Now, when they put my cancer in remission, they told me that you now have an amount of cancer we can deal with. Your, your leukemia is still in your bones. And I said, okay, how long will it be before it grows back? And they said, on the short end, four years. Some people go five, but that's about it. And I said, so in five years, I'm going to need a little touch up on chemo. And she goes, yeah, but we'll catch it in time. It won't be as drastic. You won't be throwing up all the time. Great. In my mind, if I can go six years, that's great. If I can go seven, that's wonderful. I haven't had it. We're talking in 2023. I haven't had one drop of chemo since 2007. But there's no scientist studying me, hmm. right? How did, what, am I some kind of weird enigma that it just didn't, cancer's not growing back? So what do you think it is that you did? I stopped eating this kind of stuff right. uh, for the audience. I, I'm just a checking to see if you're tempted. Yeah, there's a bowl full of chocolate something there. You will never touch it. It's full right. of dust. But to me, <laughs> to me, that's a rattlesnake. That's cancer in the bowl. People and say, what is it? The sugar? The, the sugar. sugar. It's the sugar or any kind of carbohydrate. Because here's something people don't understand about carbohydrates. If I ate or if you ate 10 of those, we would get what's known as a glucose spike. Now, you've seen this because you have kids and they're under five. You go to a birthday party with your kids and you see your kids and all of the other kids going, Wah! when you get there, right? <laughs> That's the sugar high. But I want you to notice the next time you go to a party, within 45 minutes to an hour, they're cranky. They want to go home. You'll notice their face will turn red. Sometimes they'll start crying. Sugar low. Mm -hmm. So when you eat a simple sugar spike and then below where you were. So if this is the medium line, spike and then below the medium, mm -hmm. right? That's what happens to your kids. So people would say, what about heart healthy grains like bread? That's a, a glycogen load, mm -hmm. right? So if this is normal, now dietitians will tell you to have this stuff. This is the, the good stuff. They'll call it a complex carbohydrate and somehow right. it's magically good for you. Remember, you get a spike from sugar and you go down. 
with this, you get a spike, but now you have it releasing onto your liver. That spike stays up for hours, mm -hmm. not 20, 30, 40 minutes, hours. Your body has to keep releasing insulin to try to bring that spike back down. Yeah, keep up. Right? When that happens, you think you're doing the right thing, but you have insulin constantly. So you become resistant to insulin, number one. Number two, your body can only store so much of that sugar. So it stores what it can. The rest of it turns into a long chain triglyceride, which is a fat. And that long chain triglyceride goes into your fat cell and gets stored as a fat. So every time you have bread, pasta, matzo ball, anything that's a complex carb, you're you're causing fat to go into those fat cells. Now, here's the fun part. If that wasn't enough fun, I promise, I promise to your audience, I will stop being scientific after this. <clears throat> Remember I said long chain triglyceride? Yeah. Big long fat cell? We have all of the fat cells on our body after we hit puberty that we will ever have. That's it. Now all we can do is either make them bigger or smaller because fat cells are basically a bank account, right? To store energy for later. And when you put a long chain triglyceride in there, it seeps into that cell very easily. But think of it this way. If you went to Ikea and you bought a bed, you bring it home. You and your husband, you walk it into the bedroom. Why? Because you have the frame, it's, it's taken apart. You have the mattress, you have your box spring. It's all taken apart. So you can slip it into that bedroom. But then you build the bed in the bedroom, right? Now, if you wanted to move the bed, it's hard to get out. You can't take that bed out of that bedroom unless you break it down again. Mm -hmm. Your body doesn't like to go and break down things. And it's very hard to coerce that long triglycerides from coming out of that cell. Mm. So those formative years, especially for children, when they're consuming all of the sugars and carbs, will actually have an impact on them for the rest of their lives. And that's, that's why we're saying. calling it a genetic problem, when in fact, that was a long way around for me to say, sorry, Fatima, it's not genetics. Right. It's the it's we're what we are told. This. It's what we're told yes. that is actually good for kids and okay for kids. And so do you not eat any sugars and carbs? There are two times when I have well, three times. I call it life into living. It's someone's birthday. You're at dinner with another couple and they'll say, We just got this. You gotta try this baked Alaska. I'm not gonna be the guy going, not me. No, not me. I'm better than you. I'll dip my spoon in there a couple of times because I already have the reputation for being that guy. Mm -hmm. So I'll dip my spoon in there, which allows everyone else. They were it, afraid of your judgment? Order, I'll tell you what it was. It was lobster mashed potatoes before the meal came. At Mastro's? It was at one of, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, I didn't want to, I don't know if you mentioned Mastro's. We were somewhere we at a steakhouse and it was lobster mashed potatoes and nobody was touching it. And uh, this other guy says, you know, it's because of you. So I took a spoon, I dipped it in there, yeah, put it in my mouth. Everybody and relax. Everyone went, oh, it's okay now. Right? right? So I never, so that's one situation where I'll put a carb in my mouth. Hmm. Another is if I'm in a specialty place, I'm in Rome, right? And someone says, that's the best gelato on the planet. I'm there with my wife. Right. Well, what am I going to do? Not have the gelato? Right. Right. And I also have what I call, I'm going to name drop, but my sister-in-law is a famous actress, uh, Kristen Scott Thomas. I have what I call the Kristen Scott Thomas rule. If I'm in front of her, I will have wine. Because I see her about once a year, and she's got really good wine. <laughs> it's, so basically you're saying when it's worth it. When, yeah, when it's a thing. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, if it's not a thing, I won't do it. Mm -hmm. Right? I know that we can be realistic in this conversation because, I mean, you've raised a daughter and right. it's difficult to tell a 10 year old to not touch pasta or pizza or rice or all of these things that really fall into the bucket of, you know, carbs and sugars and 
on the one hand, we want them to live their lives. We don't want them to be afraid of food. It, we live in a society where it's part of our culture also to eat certain things like that. And so we don't want our kids to feel so limited in those ways. But I also know that you have developed such a deep understanding of the science behind these things and the kind of damage that sugars and carbohydrates can create on the body. And so, I mean, you even talk about how sugar and cocaine have so many similarities, right? And so how do we, how do we approach this realistically, raising kids, allowing them to have access to this stuff, but not, I guess, in an extreme situation? That's a good question, and it's a two-part answer. First off, with my stepdaughter, we actually, and this is going above and beyond, we didn't want anybody to think that we were the weird family because little girls already have enough pressure we didn't want any added pressure, and I am not making this up. We had the peanut butter that we ate, right? That was only peanuts that were crushed. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we would buy it from the Hippy Dippy store. Most of the time it was almond butter or some other kind of butter. But we knew that when Tallulah's friends came over, we didn't want her to be the weird kid. We would literally go out and buy Jif and put it in the fridge. We wanted those kids to have what they would have at their home. Mm. And as a matter of fact, a lot of these kids love coming over to our house because they, they would wake up in the morning and say, I love that smell because there was bacon and eggs cooking. It wasn't mommy pouring cereal out going, come and get it. Mm. But pertaining to the sugar part of this, sugar and cocaine, here I go name dropping again, but I was doing Dr. Drew's show. I was saying, Drew, you know, they, they've done studies now and the brain lights up the same for sugar as it does for cocaine. And Dr. Drew is, a, is one of the, the foremost authorities on addiction medicine and addictions and all this kind of stuff. And he started waxing poetic. Well, it's not exactly the same. I mean, cocaine does this and that, the whole thing. And, and sugar does like the brain up, but it's different stuff that I was glazing. I was just glazing over. So I said, yeah, Drew, but here's the difference. We know that cocaine is bad and we give sugar to kids at birthday parties, mm. right? Both are addictive. Yes, I get it. There's a difference. That's where we are, right? right. We, we use food. Right, for comfort. For comfort in the wrong way. And we tell kids, this is okay and we need to celebrate. And I'm 60. I grew up in a world where there was cake on the weekend at my grandmother's house, right? That was a special thing. Right. I remember churning the ice cream because it was cool to make your own ice cream. Yeah. And you had some of that ice cream. It wasn't every day. Yeah. You know, we didn't have 12 pints of Hagen dazs in the freezer. Right. Now people every day, all day long, you know, the food is, mm -hmm. is just, it's omnipresent. Right. It's on the table. It's everywhere. Well, it's also very tempting. You know, one of the things I'm thinking about is when you talk about how dessert was a thing that you would consume on the weekend, I think many people are now conditioned to eat dessert after every single meal, and not only after every single meal, but many of the things that you equate with desserts are actually the full breakfast food. I, I'm thinking about cereals, right? right? These cereals, whether it's Cheerios or Lucky Charms or any of those things, are actually replacing the bacon and the eggs that you would feed your kids. And, and the first thing in the morning that a child will eat is a whole bowl of sugar, essentially. Right. And then, you know, go run off and go to school and and have to focus and work through the sugar crush, right? So how do you explain that all of us have been duped by this industry? That all of us think that these cereals are great for breakfast, that, I mean, oatmeal. I, I It's still hard for me to get it out of my brain that oatmeal is not something good to lower your cholesterol. I mean, I've just been so conditioned to believe that oatmeal is what's going to help me live a healthier life. How did all of this happen? Well, the quick history in the mid-1920s or 30s, we started discovering vitamin, which became vitamins, and we discovered that there were 13 of them that we need. You know, we learned through scurvy and this and that, the different vitamins and all the B vitamins and everything else. B12 is one of the 13 essential vitamins. For people that don't know what that means, your body does not make B12. You have to take B12. So we started to learn that you need all of these vitamins. Well, then the late 1950s come, and Dwight D. Eisenhower has 
a heart attack. And somehow he lives through it. It was a massive coronary. And a guy named Ansel Keys, who was very instrumental, he came up with a K ration that we use in military, the Keys ration, the K ration. Mm. He was on this, this whole movement of meat is bad. We don't know how he came to that, but somehow, you know, he was from Minnesota University. Someone had gotten to him. He was pushing this whole agenda that meat was bad. And when the president had a heart attack, he went, you see, the president ate meat. Here's the bigger part of Ansel Keys. He was talking about meat almost killing the president. Dwight D. Eisenhower smoked upwards of three packs of unfiltered cigarettes per day. Yeah. I'm sure he didn't want to upset the cigarette industry. So, well, and look, you know, tobacco is a vegetable. I guess it's, it's vegan. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, whether you're consuming it or smoking it, I don't know. So we, let's not look at the big elephant in the room. Let's look at something that has no relevance whatsoever. Hmm. Right. So later on in the 60s, he started down this road. And that's when he did his seven country study. They only came up with six countries. And Ansel Keys realized he had a problem because if you're studying 21 or 25 countries, six is not enough. He wanted one more. So he says, let's go back to Crete. Let's go back to Greece. And they said, all right, Ansel, we're gone. Ansel goes, not so fast. Lent is coming up. Let's go for the 40 days during Lent. So they went back to Crete. They looked around. They went, oh, look, they're not eating any meat. And look how healthy they are. These people ate meat like no other for the rest of the year. But hey, let's not let the truth get in the way of a good scientific study. Well, I, I got to push against this because what was his incentive to come up with a flawed study? Was he just so committed to his idea that he would do whatever he can to support it? Or, I mean, was he paid off by, I don't know, the sugar and grains industry? Like, why would he do that? Why would he bring a flawed study to the United States? He was a bully. And bullies like to bully people. And he was a dog with a bone. He had this theory. He was pushing it through no matter what. And um, th there was a scientist from England, John Yutkin, who said, you're completely wrong. It's sugar. He got John Yutkin shut down. Mm. Oh, these Brits don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. It can't be sugar. During Lincoln's administration, the average American ate less than one pound of sugar per person per year. Mm. Today, depending on which study you look at, the smallest study I've ever seen was 175 pounds per person per year. 175 pounds of sugar. Wow. Can you imagine how much sugar we would have to yeah. put in this room? That's yeah. what people eat per year. And I've seen some studies up to 300 pounds. So let's say it's between 150 and 300. That's a lot of sugar. Right. Because it's in everything. And also everything is processed. When I visit some of my friends' homes, like half of their pantry is stuff that lasts forever, which is yeah. great that it lasts forever. But like that stuff is so processed. And one thing that I've been thinking about recently is, is it possible that the reason we've been pushed to believe that so much of this processed food is good for us is because it's simply very profitable, you know, for America and I guess for anybody to sell processed food. It's a lot cheaper to make. The shelf life, you know, if you have a store, it just lasts for a long time. And much of the processed food seems to have come in at the same time where we had the food stamps. And so what a great way for the government to make food easily accessible if you can make it not that expensive. And so you can give the food stamps and just tell everybody, okay, well, you know, use these food stamps to buy processed food. Is, the, is there a link over there? I mean, there, I, this is just me. There's a bit of a link. Two, two or three things happened. The food stamp thing was one of them. And I'll explain what that means. Back during the, the Great Depression, we had a crisis in this country and farms, remember you heard this back in 2008 also, farms were too big to fail. We still worked on the farm system. The government started subsidizing farms, right? And when you do that, these people were able to grow crops and the whole thing. Now we have this overabundance of grains. And we start learning that we can start shipping these grains worldwide. 
right? We have a commodity that we can ship mm. worldwide. So we've created that. Governments still subsidize farms. We know that. You can drive north of here. We're in California and you'll go through a dust bowl where they pay these farmers not to grow crops to create a market. So the government controls the economics on the grains. That's one side of it. Okay. Now they're in bed with the farmers. You, you see what's going on there. Then you get to 1969 and the Democrats are running for office and it's like, hey, if we give people something, they'll vote for us. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I don't talk about politics. This is not about politics. But one side is going, hey, we'll just keep giving people something. They'll keep voting for us. So they were trying to get, you know, into office. And so they said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we come up with this food stamp program and feed poor people? I think it's a great idea. Let's help poor people by giving them food. Everyone loves that idea, right? Who's going to take food out of an American's mouth? I'm not. Will you? I don't think so. So they put together something called the McGovern Committee. The McGovern Committee met for 10 years. Can you imagine? Think of all these committees that pop up nowadays. <laughs> you know, you want to impeach this guy. You want to get rid of that guy. We have committees every other week. The McGovern Committee met ongoing 10 years. Now, they figured out food stamps pretty quickly in there. But during that time, Ansel Keys, remember him from 1958, 57, he got himself in there and they kept the study going. They kept this committee going because they were trying to say, hey, we should come up with a standardized way for Americans to eat. And I, again, I show this in, in my first movie, Fatter Documentary. At the end of it, I show the footage of the people on the committee literally throwing their hands up and going, we don't know, we, we, let's just vote. You want to go with heart healthy grains and let's get rid of all the saturated fat. Let's go with that. And within a couple of years, we adopted something from Switzerland or Sweden or somewhere. They had somewhat of a pyramid. We kind of made their pyramid our pyramid. We put 11 servings of grains on the bottom. And if you look at it, on the first two levels, you end up with like 21 or 22, I can't remember anymore, servings of carbohydrates per day. And at the top, if, if you're not stuffed from all that, have a piece of meat, but a small piece. So the purpose of this McGovern Committee was to essentially create this food pyramid, which now we know is upside down. Yeah. Is that basically it? it? wasn't what they were trying to do. That's what came That's out what of they, it. That's what came out of it. Yeah. Right. They were and then it all went food. into marketing, right? I mean, it's just like on every commercial. And I mean, you were part of those commercials. You were, um, I guess you were a model for I some was. of these workouts. And I don't know if you did Slim Fast, but I remember a big portion of my childhood was watching all these <laughs> infomercials about how if you do this thing for 10 minutes, you can have abs like people like you. <laughs> yeah. My, my favorite thing when I was modeling was, they would always call guys like me in to do beer ads. Beer? Yeah, beer. Because apparently when you drink a lot of beer, you have a 12 pack on your gut. Uh, you, you are ripped and you can dive and get a, a volleyball before it hits the sand. <laughs> yeah. But it was that. It was infomercials. It was these lies. that, And I was part of that. Right. Because when I first got to Hollywood, I had to earn a living. Mm. I had no other way. And an actress friend of mine saw me and she goes, we were actually on the beach one day and I was like, God, I, I don't have any way of making money. And she was like, with those abs, I had really good abs. You'll never stop working. Mm -hmm. So I went to an agent and she was, she had me working like the next week. I didn't, I was ashamed to tell people <laughs> what I did for a living. I was 30 years old. That sounded weird yeah. to me. I was 29. It just sounded weird to me. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you were a part of the, I guess, the marketing machine of really it was misinformation about, you know, food yeah. and exercise and that whole world, which people came to believe that they would look like you as long as they did those things in the infomercials. We uh, and I tell people this all the time. Back when I was modeling, I did a few before and afters, you know, for products. I won't mention the products, but we would shoot the before picture and the after picture within 30 minutes of each other. Hmm. So you guys know about camera work around here, right? You take a guy like me, 
take my sh shirt off, almost powder my stomach. You know, they, they would have, you know, let's get some white on him. And um, they would put the bright lights on you and they would tell you to distend your gut. So that you had a gut sticking out and they would shoot a bunch of pictures. Oh my gosh. And then you would go into makeup. They would wipe all that off. They would bronze you up a bit and say, all right, now go in and flex. And yeah. we're going before and after, taken within 20 minutes of each other. And I felt like such a fraud. I had to make, I was like, I'm doing this for the, the betterment of something else. It's the wrong thing to do. And I was young then, and I was trying to make a living to stay out here. And I still have nightmares about that, hmm. that I knew I was lying to people like my mom and dad. Hmm. I was not proud. Right. Well, I know you also came out to Los Angeles with a mission to actually teach about food and nutrition, right? You had yeah. this vision of, of a kid's show, right? That actually teaches children how to eat healthy. And, and what happened there? You pitched it to a bunch of executives and first they loved it and then they nixed it? I come out of Tulane University with a degree in exercise physiology and nutrition. I immediately got hired by the top school, Newman School in New Orleans, to become their strength and conditioning coach and teach nutrition and all this stuff. I graduated high school in 81. I'm working there in 86. That is not a large amount of time. But I saw obesity happening already. And I saw what these kids were walking into my gym, drinking Gatorades, drinking Cokes, Ho-Hos and Ding Dongs, foods I've still not tried in my life. And I'm they're coming in and it's like, what are, what are you doing eating this stuff? And they're like, we need energy, coach. We need, I, I need energy. I'm falling apart. I need energy. In between sets, they would eat junk food. I couldn't believe what I was seeing as far as their bodies already morphing because my job is to look at bodies, right? And I'm looking at these young athletic bodies not looking the same as they looked in 1981. Certainly not looking like the athletes I played ball with at Tulane. So I knew there was a problem. I started looking at, should I go where media is and try to put these ideas forward? Because I bet they don't even know this. I was that naive. And I got meetings at the biggest children's program, you know, every Mickey Mouse networks. place you can possibly go to. And they all welcomed me with open arms. And they said, what, what, what are you proposing we do here? I said, we need to get them off of fruit roll-ups and we need to get them off of cereal and we need to get them. And they were like, wait, what? I said, we got to get rid of Snickers bars. You know, Coca-Cola is not a good idea, mm -hmm. you know? And they were like, yeah, we can't do that. Why? That's our advertisers. You're telling us to tell people not to eat what our advertisers are telling them to eat. We, we can't do that. Can you just tell them to exercise a little bit? It's like, I could for one show, but you want to turn this into a series. One of the ideas I had, you're too young to remember this. I wanted to do interstitials. Do you even know what that is? Do no. you know that term? No. When I was a kid, in between Saturday programs, they had something called Schoolhouse Rock. Yes, I know Schoolhouse. You know, yeah. Conjunction, Junction. Yeah, you learn about the Constitution. Function. Yeah, you yeah. learn about the Constitution. They, yeah. they did a bunch of different things. You, you learned about history. You learned right. how to how to spell things. You know, you, you, you learn stuff. It was in between programs, and they were cartoons, and they were like three to five minutes long. Yeah. I'm still singing Conjunction, Junction. I'm, yeah. I'm 60 years old. Yeah. Right? Okay. I wanted to do that with health and fitness. Oh, that would be amazing. You think? Yeah. I, I still think. But no, they didn't uh, want it because not, it, it would be bad for business. It'd be bad not, for no, business. it wouldn't be bad for business. It would it, kill business. It would kill business. Right. It would kill business. Yeah, they, they, I, either, they would get rid of me on day one, so why even start? Mm -hmm. It's a non-starter. Right. Right? So, And if you remember the one um, about cheese, remember that one? have a hunky, healthy hunk of cheese or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, they were telling you about the calcium and the protein. Right. And the, the, the wedge of cheese was a cartoon. He would make arms yeah. and do all this stuff. And that's all gone. Right. Where did it go? We're telling people cheese is now bad for you. Right, right. Instead, have like protein bars, right? right. Or granola bars. Which is all, you might as well have a Snickers. Mm-hmm. We've just been manipulated. Like all, uh, your your whole story of you know, 
learning what's right for your body and taking care of your body and being part of the whole media institution that really propagated all of this misinformation, I think really led you to look at this whole system through, with empathy. And, you know, the fact that you just kind of want to, I guess, give back and help people. And it's, it's, it's a real bummer that you weren't able to create that kids show because I would have grown up with that and I would have had better information. I want to end with a quick little game. <laughs> so, which I know is not easy because there are a whole bunch of foods that I am personally confused about. And I would love to get your reaction to these okay. foods. So you have one sentence for each of the food items that I mentioned. Okay. If I have a, something to redact or just something to, like. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay you, you, it's your game. I, I don't it's mean to mess game. up your game. Okay. You ready? Let's go. Whole wheat cereal. It's not good for you. It's whole wheat or regular cereal is bad for you. Oatmeal. Just like whole wheat cereal. There's nothing good about it. Brown rice. Brown rice, white rice. It doesn't matter what color your rice is. Your liver is a meritocracy. It does not know the difference. It's all bad. <sighs> all right. Quinoa. Quinoa. <laughs> so no one quinoa. Yeah, let's go with no. <laughs> no on quinoa. No on quinoa. All right. How about seed bread? Seed bread. I don't even know what that uh, is. I don't know. I don't know either. Do, you're you, the, mean, do you're... you mean sprouted bread? Sprouted bread. Okay. Sprouted bread is... Like, you know, the Ezekiel bread? Yeah, like that kind of stuff. It's still bread. I don't care if you put a biblical name to it. It's still just bread. So you don't touch that stuff? No. No. Okay. Lettuce? Neither here nor there. I mean, it... <clears throat> It's not nutritious. It's just fiber and water. So have at it. Okay. Bugs? Bugs. <laughs> Crickets? We need to stop this whole bug thing. We have cows. We have goats. We have chicken. We have every kind of meat for protein you want to ever eat. We do not have to eat bugs and worms. But is it bad for you or good no, for it's, you? No, it's not, it's not bad for you. All right. Salt? Salt. Salt gets a bad rap because we have sodium, but we need real salt. Salt got bastardized the same way as saturated fat at some point. Oh. Actual salt we need. You know, you ever hear that term? He's worth his salt. Mm. Right? We need salt to live. You cut salt out of the human diet and you're going to have big problems. Mm. So would you say salt in moderation or like whenever you want, just put salt all over put your Put salt food? on food, you know, have salt. You're not afraid of salt. Water. Not afraid of salt at all. Wow, fascinating. How about fruit? It depends on the fruit. So this is going to be longer than a sentence. I uh, know you said one sentence, but if you're eating berries or cherries, they're very low glycemic fruit. So those are something you can have in moderation, have them you know, as a treat after dinner, this kind of thing. You want to give it to your kids as a snack. Well, people say, well, what about apples? No one ever died. Apple a day keeps the doctor away. What about apples? And, and okay, high in, in fiber, lots of water. And even though it has a sugar content to it, that could be dangerous. Not bad for your kids or anyone. You can enjoy apples, right? But again, more in moderation. When you get into tropical fruits, uh, bananas, papayas. Pineapple? Pineapple, yes. The, these fruits are all very, very, you might as well just be eating straight sugar. What about kiwis? They have a lot of vitamin C, no? K kiwis fall into that same kind of middle category. And we don't need, look, we're not going to get scurvy. No one's going to die of, you know, everyone goes, oh, we need the vitamin C. We're crazy about vitamin C. No one's dying of that. And let me just add to it, even though you're not asking. People say, what are your favorite fruits? Meaning, what are my favorite mm -hmm. fruits? Olives and avocados. Two favorite fruits. <laughs> what about like sweet, yummy fruit? I said berries and cherries. <laughs> <laughs> what about keto snacks? You know, you're really big on not eating all the grains. And so there are lots of these keto snacks. Look, I don't agree. I'm one of the people who brought keto to the world. It, when I first started doing this, I, that's why I created NSNG, no sugars, no grains, because I, I was afraid to use the word ketogenic because most doctors would go, that's ketoacidosis and they're trying to kill people. But out of the word ketogenic came keto and it didn't take industry very long to turn that into, let's start making snacks with keto. Here's the thing. When you see on food, keto certified or certified keto, 
There is no government group certifying keto at all. So who's certifying it? No one. They're certifying themselves? You can take sugar. You can take table sugar, put it in a bowl, wrap it up, put it in the grocery store, and put certified keto on it, and there's no one coming after you. <laughs> so it's funny. now keto has become a marketing ploy, just like everything else, just like heart healthy grains. We're there with keto. Wow. Right. We're, we're calling everything keto and they're going and, and different, different thing. Net carbs. Have you seen this? Net carbs. It's net carb of six. Industry figured out, okay, it might have 15 grams of carb in it, but we're going to subtract the fiber. It, let's say it has 10 grams of fiber. So we're going to say six grams of net carbs. That's made up out of whole, just, just whole cloth. That's it. So what do you snack on? Then I mentioned avocados and olives. <laughs> what, whatever happened to, maybe I'm a little too European. You know, I, 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 my great grandparents, they came here from Italy. When I have a snack, there's some cheese, you know, charcuterie. There'll be cheese on the board. There'll be black olives. There'll be uh, walnuts, this kind of thing. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? You know, I, I was doing a cheese board one day. My buddy was at the house and I took some good olive oil and I kind of did like a Zorro thing across it. He goes, what the? I said, don't you like olive oil? He goes, were you pouring it? I said, yeah, everybody likes olive oil. Everyone loves olives. Everyone loves cheese. Everyone loves nuts. Why can't you just have it all together? Well, I love a cheese board, especially with red wine, but I'll ask you about that one later. <laughs> um, okay, how about Beyond Meat? Uh, you know, like I did a whole documentary called Beyond Impossible, shameless plug. But, you know, I looked at this stuff and I said, okay, they're doing two things. They're trying to make us healthier and they're trying to save the planet. Mm. Okay, most of these products start off somewhere in China and they have to put them together. And then they have to use some kind of diesel power to get it to the United States, mm -hmm. to a factory where they use more diesel power to mix it up. So I'm not sure how Greta and her gang is saving the planet with Beyond Burgers, but they're saying this is better for the environment than a cow belch. Not really sure how they got there. Right. And then they said, well, it's better for you than for meat. For you, yeah. It's an abomination. It's, it's a processed junk food that they're, and by the way, it's, it's showing up now because they can't, they can't get enough money to keep the stock going. The stock has like plummeted since my movie came out. So, so no, so no. no on these meats. <laughs> what about some of the juices like orange juice or coconut juice, fresh pressed juice? Are they all the same? No. Okay. Coconut juice is going to have all, all the juices are going to have a lot of sugar. Coconut juice could have some of the fat in it, but that doesn't give it a buy round. Coconut oil is good for you. Coconut fiber is good for you. Coconut milk is good. For you. But coconut juice like this, uh, they, they were selling coconut water for yes, a while. Yes, coconut water. A natural Gatorade is what they were trying yeah. to call it. Is it not? Mm, no. If you just look at it, your liver looks at it and goes, oh, look. Yeah, you know, she sugar. just gave me, Marissa gave me some sugar here. I'm going to treat it like sugar. Uh, orange juice is kind of different because most of it comes from some bastardized version of it or it comes from concentrate or whatever. Sometime during the, um, I want to say it was the Clinton administration, he did a great thing. He said, we're going to pull all of the soda out of schools. And I went, great, President Clinton, you did a great job. You took the sodas out of school. But he didn't remove the soda machines. He just said, we need to get soda out. Mm. The same companies filled it up with juice. Mm. Kids go to school. Now, you, juice has got to be healthier for you. It's apple juice. It's pineapple juice. It's orange juice. It's not healthier. It's even more sugar. But doesn't the orange juice have vitamin D? A lot of kids need vitamin D. You get that from the sun. You know, and by the way, we're not doing our kids any favors by spreading. And that's a whole different conversation. Spreading them with all of this oil and everything to keep the sun off. We get vitamin D from the sun. That's our number one source. You mean like the sunblock? Yeah, the sunblocks, the SPF 50s and what have you. I get it. You don't want your, your little loved ones to get burnt. But at some point, you need to get some sun. We need to let these kids get out and play a bit. And by the way, usually if you're getting vitamin D from a fruit juice, it's being fortified in some way, shape, or form. Hmm. How about 
like beef jerky or any of the jerkies? Like the jerky boys or? Okay. <laughs> the jerky boys are horrible. I don't care what anyone says. I've never liked the no jerky, jerky boys. No jerky boys. <laughs> okay. All right. So beef jerky, right? The stuff you get in the store, I've never found one that's just not full of sugar, right? It's, it's, mm. it's, how, it's how they get it to taste nummy. Like the teriyaki the, flavoring that they put on it. Yeah, the teriyaki flavor, the barbecue flavor, the this flavor, that flavor. Every now and again, and I, I encourage your audience to go, usually you can go to Amazon or one of these places and find the one. Don't look at the nutrition facts because there's nothing factual in nutrition facts. Look at ingredients. Mm. You want it to say meat, salt, something like paprika, and pepper. If it goes anywhere past that, if you see any kind of fruit juice or this, uh, that's just sugar being added to it. You can find it. It's almost impossible. A better way to do it is to go out, get yourself a dehydrator. They're very inexpensive. You will save a lot of money because you can make beef jerky at home and make it exactly the way you want it. And you will thank me for that. You'll say, well, I, I didn't know it was so easy. You pop it in the oven, you dehydrate it with a dehydrator, and you're done. Okay, so speaking of things that you can make for snacks, what about cashews? Are they okay? Cashews are at the low end of the good nuts. Of course, that's why I like it. They're at the low end. Look, if you get down into my favorite nut, the pistachio, that's you might as well have a potato chip. Oh. They're, they're very low in fat, very high in carbs. But you're, you're right, you're teetering that border with the cashew. Okay. Right. So what, macadamia and almond are at the top? Macadamia is up there. Um, Brazil, which I don't understand oh, how anyone eats so it. They just taste like dirt. Um, I mean, they taste good if you dip them in chocolate. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Walnuts, pecans. Right. These are your higher fat nuts. They're delicious. And what, you buy them raw or can they be salted? Because you're okay with salt. I'm okay with salt, but here's the problem. Usually the way they get salt to stick to any nut is by putting a seed oil. Seed oils are bad for you. So if you want to keep seed oils away from it, buy them raw, bring them home, use olive oil to, you know, just to get a little oil on them. Use fine salt, finely ground pepper, whatever you like. Um, I, I use, sometimes I'll use barbecue powder that has no mm -hmm. sugar in it. Mm -hmm. I'll sprinkle them, put them on a cookie sheet, throw them in the oven at 350. Keep an eye, about 15 minutes will do it, but your oven might be different. It might take 20, it might take 12. Hmm. Keep an eye when they start to smell like they're going to burn, pull them out, and you have the best nuts. I mix them all together for football season. Hmm. I'll do three or four nuts. And do you and just eat a whole bunch of nuts? I mean, that's a ton of calories. It's not, calories never made anyone fat. You don't care, but you don't count calories. I, I've never counted a calorie. So, ever. like, I could, you would say I could eat just a whole bag of those nuts. And no, no, nuts are not something you go crazy with because there are a lot of carbs in them. You know, there are carbs. Mm -hmm. And let, let me be very clear in, in this interview there's nothing you can eat with impunity, mm -hmm. right? I'm not saying, hey, go home. Vinny says that, you know, just like the wine, Vinny says wine. You know, no, it doesn't work that way. But if you're going to eat nuts, you might as well have the healthiest version of nuts you can possibly have. Hmm. You mentioned supplements. What are your thoughts on supplements? Like I, I've heard all kinds of things where if you take these supplements and vitamins, you're likely going to just urinate them. Expensive pee. You know, I, I, I this is full disclosure. I own a vitamin company. Uh, so, you know, when you have a hammer, everything becomes a nail. Hmm. We don't sell crazy supplements that are going to help you lose weight or this is going to give you brain power because that's a lot of lies there. Mm -hmm. I do believe, not what I believe, I've gotten this from because we study it, right? Most people are lacking in some vitamins. We mentioned vitamin D when we were talking about, you know, no one goes outside anymore. Americans need vitamin D. We learned during the pandemic that a lot of people who got really sick mm -hmm. were all, you know, one of the things, and this doesn't mean that you're going to get really bad COVID if you don't take it, but people who had long COVID and really bad COVID, one of the co founding factors was low vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Another one that people don't get enough of, it's a mineral. It's magnesium. You know, you'll see all these things. I have weak bones, take more calcium. We get enough calcium. You eat a little cheese every day, you're calciumed up, right? But calcium works in conjunction with magnesium. 
And most Americans, I'm saying Americans, but you can bring out to the world, lacking in magnesium because we're not getting it from our vegetables anymore. We don't get it from our food source anymore. Almost, I tell everyone, if you don't take anything else, take magnesium. What about zinc? Zinc is not, you know, we get enough zinc, but it's been shown that zinc can help when, you, you know, your immune system is compromised. You take a little extra zinc and it's not a whole lot, mm -hmm. right? Just a small amount of zinc, but it's not something that you need ongoing once you're through with, you know, suffering from a cold or a flu or anything else. And so, I mean, I think we can do a whole interview just about supplements. Oh, I can do three there's, hours of There's also the multivitamins, right? Like Centrum, for example, or the things that we all grew up with just grabbing in the in the drugstore. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is can we, I mean, it's just so hard to take so many different ones. Can't we just take a multivitamin? Uh, I thought so. And Centrum was the reason, and I don't mean to pick on one brand, but it was the reason that I started my company, Pure Vitamin Club. When I had cancer, I couldn't believe I got cancer because I thought I was eating as healthy as I could, right? And I started looking at everything post-cancer. And one day, I wasn't taking Centrum. I was taking another high-end brand of vitamins, like one of the expensive ones you buy at Whole Foods. And I looked at the package, and I saw titanium dioxide. So I went to the vitamin. I went over to Sprouts a big store out here in California, I, I was taking all the top brands, titanium dioxide. T every one of them had titanium dioxide. This was driving me nuts because I had been painting, you know, a, a few days before that. And like I read painting a, a painting. wall? Yeah, I was painting a wall. I don't paint. I'm not like... <laughs> I was like, wow, you're an artist, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a painter. You know, I'm, I'm too cheap to hire the guy. So... I'm painting and I noticed on, I'm stirring the can of white paint. I saw titanium dioxide written. I went, wait a minute. This is in my paint and it's in my vitamins. So I went on and started doing a deep dive. It turns out that even in nanoparticles, titanium dioxide has been known to cause colon cancer amongst other things. Why would they put that in a vitamin? Interesting because I went down, you see, this is how you start a vitamin company. You start with curiosity. <laughs> they want to whitewash the vitamin. They want to whiten all the minerals. So it takes, it actually takes away some of the potency of the vitamin. Well, are they for what? For just so it looks good? Why are they well, whitening they, the vitamin? They whiten it so that then they can add in another color to make it look the way you think it should look, like a nice bright orange or whatever, they, a nice good yellow color or something like that. So they whiten it and then they add in more junk, which further bastardizes what you're trying to take for your health. So by the time you put it in your mouth, and then, can I add something to this? Titanium dioxide is bad enough, but they also put something called magnesium stearate. And I know you're gonna think that's good because hey, it's magnesium. Sounds like magnesium, yeah. It's not magnesium taurate or carbonate or glyconate or any of the good magnesiums. This is a magnesium, like an industrial magnesium. And the reason they put it in there is because time is money. It's an excipient. It's a flow agent. It helps the magnesium at the factory flow like a powder, if you will, to help them. The, the supplement helps all the other vitamins, you know, fill up the little capsules or the tablets. So it's just like a manufacturing benefit. Yeah. It has nothing to do with your health. I did a deep dive and magnesium stearate actually blocks the absorption of not only the nutrients from that vitamin, but everything else that your liver is trying to get to absorb into your system. So magnesium stearate is actually, you ever notice sometimes if you take a vitamin, you'll have very, very lively looking pee. Yeah. And you go, look yeah. at that, I just wasted all well, my money. Well, that's why I think we pee our, our vitamins. With magnesium stearate, it passes all of the vitamin A and all the Bs, the Bs are the colorful ones, pushes them right through your system. So you never get the, get the absorption. Vitamin B12. Most people, like if you have a deficiency in B12, even if you take more of it, ingest it, it may not raise that because people who have a deficiency, and I'm one of them, mm. we absorb that in our small intestine. And some people, you can eat a ton of meat and you won't even get that B12 enough through the meat mm -hmm. because we stop doing that as we age. Yeah. 
So the only way to get B12 into your system is to inject it, no fun, or to put it on a membrane where our bloodstream can get it immediately. So you could put it under your tongue. Mm -hmm. So you've seen sublingual B12s, right? Mm -hmm. There's two types. There's one called cyanocobalamin, and there's another one called methylcobalamin. If cyano sounds a lot like cyanide, it's actually hooked to a cyanide molecule. <laughs> so the thing you're taking for your health is hooked to something that in larger doses will kill you. Wow. So folks, if you're going to buy B12, get methylcobalamin. Okay. And if you're going to get uh, folate, you want methylfolate. Right. Well, my mom gets B12 with, through a shot. That's, that's a, one way to get it. And that works very well. But that's a painful shot, mm -hmm. and it's a viscousy shot, mm -hmm. and it could be done under her tongue. Mm -hmm. I'll send your mom some of ours because we, we have a methylcobalamin. We're the only company in the world. Most of the sublinguals are hooked to a sugar cube. Mm -hmm. I figured out a system to hook it to a little piece of calcium, mm -hmm. and um, you put it under your tongue so you have no sugar, no cyanide. Wow. And we have the, the, the process of doing that. We have to make a tool to make that product. So I'll get you some. Awesome. Coffee. Okay, again, this is going to sound... One and a half sentences. <laughs> I own a coffee company. <laughs> All right. How do you say coffee to a guy that owns a coffee company? Right. Again, folks, take this with a grain of salt, real salt, not sodium. Coffee is probably the second healthiest thing you can drink next to water. Wow. It's the number one consumed beverage next to water in the world. The AHA, the American Heart Association, has come out finally and said that for every cup of coffee you drink per day, you lessen your rate of getting a heart attack by 10%. So if you drink two, it goes to 20. If you drink three, it goes to 30. Wow. I've been yelling about this since the 80s, and people called me a kook. I, I really had a tinfoil hat on back then, but... Coffee is actually an antioxidant. It gets rid of free radicals. And if you're going to say, well, what about tea? Tea is the close cousin to coffee. It does just the same. Wow. It's just everything so upside down. It's, it's bizarro world where I live. Okay. <laughs> Fatty Wagyu beef. Delicious. And it's great for you. Would you eat it every day? If, yeah, if I could afford it. <laughs> right. uh, butter fried eggs. Butter fried eggs. That's the way I just had three eggs right before I got here. So yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Not margarine. Not margarine. Butter. Real butter. Real butter. Frying your eggs. That's the way to do it. That's the, the only way to do it. Margarine Every day as much nugget. as you want? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Almond milk. It's an abomination. I'm an abomination, but it's, it's almonds. A, almonds are good for you, no? Yeah. Almonds are good for you. I have a company that, that uses almonds in a product. Almonds are great. Almond milk is nothing but a sugary drink because it's not almonds. They're, they're, they're literally taking the carbs and the milkiness. The, they're grinding it up, mixing it with milk, straining it. Does that sound healthy to you? What? Okay, this is like a whole nother hour. I'm going to have to bring you back because like some people say that they can't, they can't drink milk. And so what else can they drink? And so uh, yeah. it, usually people that can't drink milk, this is for your audience. Try goat milk. Okay. You know, you go in that direction for you because sometimes people have trouble with lactose yeah. and just different things. And uh, so and, and if you live in an Amish area, try their milk because sometimes... Nobody lives in an Amish area. I do. <laughs> <laughs> their butter is insane. It is insane. <laughs> but if you live where people milk their own, you might yeah. get a better milk there. But usually, you know, it's the lactose or something in milk that will stop people. Try goat milk. Even though there's lactose, it's a different thing. Okay, so no on almond milk because it's pretty much sugary and instead go for goat milk. Yeah. Okay, whole milk? Great. As much as you want? No. Okay. If you're a kid, yes. The problem with milk is that there's, a, again, a lot of lactose. Even we call whole milk 5% in this country. When you go to European countries, it's much higher. So it's a lot healthier. Right. So with milk, you don't want to have all that lactose. So if you're having a small amount, you're putting it in your coffee, you're having a small glass. But just to go willy nilly on milk after your third birthday, not really needed. OK. Protein shakes and protein powders. 
That's longer than a sentence. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. In general, no. Uh, protein powders, by definition, is an engineered food. I used it during cancer. I work with a lot of people with cancer. They're wasting away. If you're going to use a protein powder, the best form to use is whey. W-H-E-Y. It comes from milk. Whey protein. And there are three versions of it. You know, just concentrate. And there's isolate, where you're isolating away from more of the lactose and the fat. So there's protein isolate. And then there's casein. And the casein, I say casein or casein, that makes up 80% of what they get from the rennet. So you can take any form of it and you'll get all the amino acids you need. And it's actually good. Soy protein is not even close. None of the vegan proteins are even close. But I tell vegans that if you insist on being a vegan, use those proteins because you're not getting enough anywhere else. Okay. Last, very important, red wine. <laughs> you're great, killing me, Benny. <laughs> great song. You know, over the years, we hear about resveratrol. Yeah. You would have to drink like three bottles of wine per day. Mm -hmm. So you would still put it in the category of it, enjoy it every once in a while. Yeah, enjoy. If you want to have a glass of wine, enjoy it for the glass of wine. Mm -hmm. Do not think you're drinking a health food drink. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Well, this was fascinating. A lot of food for thought. And uh, I'll end with thank you and stay motivated. <laughs> thank you for having me.